Hey coaches, before we get into today's episode, I just want to remind you that my book, The Culture System, A Proven Process for Creating an Extraordinary Team Culture, it is available. And the feedback has been, well, nothing short of remarkable. Uh, Coaches, new coaches and veteran coaches are calling it the best book on culture they've ever read. Just this week, I had two coaches who have been coaching each over 30 years. They sent me an email with that feedback and how they wish they had this 15, 20, 30 years ago. Anyways, I hope you'll get your copy today because it's the best way to support your leadership development and your team's culture this year. It will help you. I guarantee it. Um, If you're a listener of this podcast and you get value from this podcast, that's great. Um, But, you know, you can be jumping all over, you know, from different topics week to week. This book is going to give you not just a plan, but a system that you can tailor to your program to build the culture. It brings everything that we've learned over the last six, seven years uh, of our work at TOC Culture Consulting. It brings it all together to help you implement within your program. Progress is acknowledging where you are and where you want to be without allowing the space between the two to cause you mental tension. If anything, it should inspire you to continue moving forward peacefully and diligently. Having goals without attachments produces faster results. That's an excerpt from the book Clarity and Connection by Young Playblow. And it was a timely read for me during the recording of this episode because when I read that, I I read it as this. The process is acknowledging where you are and where you want to be without allowing the space between the two to cause you mental tension. If anything, it should inspire you to continue moving forward peacefully and diligently. Having goals without attachments produces faster results. As coaches, leaders, and people, I think we let that space between where we are and where we want to be to cause discontentment. Like we compare our teams to past seasons, we compare our circumstances to those of other teams in our league, We compare this generation of players to the generation of players we came up in. And none of this does us any good. In fact, it does a lot of harm and a lot of harm to those around us. We can acknowledge where we are and still strive for better without being miserable and discontent. And that's what we're talking about in today's episode of the Coaching Culture Podcast. Welcome. I'm JP Nurbin, the founder of TOC Culture Consulting and the author of The Culture System, I'm joined today by my friend and co-host, Nate Sanderson. Each week in around 30 minutes, we talk about culture and leadership. In today's episode, it's just the two of us. No guests, but we are unpacking something we think plagues all leaders at certain points. If you want the notes to today's episode and every episode of the podcast, head on over to tocculture.com to subscribe to our weekly newsletter there. Well, JP, I want to open up our conversation this week talking about a word that may be a little bit controversial when I bring it up here. And that is, it's one of the most dangerous words in coaching, I think, because it can lead us into some places that are very unproductive and create some anxiety and some frustration that really are all because of the way that we're approaching a problem. And the word that I'm really careful of trying to avoid in my coaching is the word should. I find myself whenever I look at my team or I look at a player, I look over our season and I think we should have been better. We should have worked harder. We should have done this. Or my team is their preseason number one or they're picked to rank the comp, you know, win the conference or we should be over 500. Then all of a sudden we get into our season one weekend, two weeks in, or we go through a rut and we're struggling. As soon as I start thinking we should, we should, we should, oftentimes that leads me to a place of, maybe complaining and comparison and some other things rather than just accepting where we are and trying to solve the problem. Now, you might be listening to this and thinking, but wait a minute, coach, aren't we supposed to have high expectations and be demanding and be driving toward continued excellence, always striving for more? And I'd say, yes, that's that's true. We should do that. But let me give you an example, JP, to kind of get our conversation started here. I have a an eight-year-old and a five-year-old at home, and they just started going to Mount Vernon for the first time. They've been going to Springville, where I coached before, and now we're bringing them down to, to be in the same district that I'm coaching in for the first time in the last five years. Now, our five-year-old is going into kindergarten. She's 
spent two years of preschool at, at Springville, but she was super excited last week for the first day of school. My eight-year-old, on the other hand, was not so excited because the night before we're ready to go to school, she's threatening to chain herself to her bed. She doesn't want to go to school. She never wants to go to school again because she's just struggling to be able to accept that this is a decision that has been made. And so the thing that has her riled up and unable to sleep and all anxious about the following day is that she can't except like this is where we are and so she's comparing not having her friends from springville and what's her teacher going to be like and all the things that have been familiar to her and fair enough that is a challenge for any of us when we jump into a new situation but i just found it fascinating to compare my five-year-old who wasn't hung up on any of those things and just looked at this as an opportunity to play on a bigger playground and to meet some new friends Versus my eight-year-old who just couldn't get over the fact that this is a decision that has been made as a family. And I think in coaching, there's something there in that analogy that we can get ourselves into that place where our, our eight-year-old, our third grader was, where it's just so hard for us to accept whatever our circumstances are and to be able to move forward because we get stuck in comparison to the way we think things should be. Well, one of the reasons I think this is so dangerous uh, comes down to that that quote, you know, comparison is the thief of all joy. And I think it really steals our joy from the job, you know, from the job as as a coach. You know, there's going to be things, um, things are going to happen that we don't think should happen. People are not going to do all the things that we think they should do, right? We, we can go into these comparisons all day long um, and it will steal our joy. And I think also, sadly, it will steal the joy of our players. If we constantly coach and lead and live in this way. And I remember reflecting back on my high school experience and what it felt like to play for my coach. And every year he had this tradition of, of constantly, you know, comparing us to previous seasons players. And, and I'm, he did the exact same for those guys, right? It, it was, oh, if you could only work as hard as that guy, if you're only as tough as, you know, so-and-so, and you're constantly com compared to other people. And I think it's great to, you know, share examples of other great players before that worked hard and emulate what the program's about. But when you're constantly being compared to that, you know, to other individuals, as a player myself, um, the discontent that, that my coach lived with, you know, he kind of put it on us. And I kind of got this feeling like, man, nothing that I ever do will ever be good enough for this guy. And I, I get that that can be a motivator. Like some coaches use that as a motivator. Like that coach or that leader, nothing's ever good enough for him. You just constantly are grinding and working to please them. Nothing's ever good enough. And it motivates a lot of individuals, but I think in a really, really unhealthy manner. And I think everyone at the end of the day is miserable through the experience. And so I think what we're really trying to do is, is, is move away from a coaching from a place where we're constantly discontent. We're constantly, you know, unhappy with the circumstances, uh, and we're trying to move more towards not complacency, but to a, a place where we are content. We are content uh, that this is where we are, and how to, and we're going to focus on how we can make the best of these circumstances. JP, I think it's worth taking a moment to start thinking a little bit about like where do we see this word should pop up? Because I think certainly you talked about a great example there, and I wrote about this in the newsletter about a month ago of the tendency to want to compare to teams from our past or players from our past, right? And that can be sometimes informative and sometimes that can be useful. Sometimes that can help a team sort of see the way, you know, to being successful. But at the same time, if looking back and saying, well, our kids this year, they're not coming in as much as last year. And that causing me to be frustrated, which causes me to treat this team differently than maybe I did the team five years ago when they were coming in, or that I, I sell those players short or whatever it might be. I, I interact with them in a more negative way because I'm frustrated that they're not who our team was five years ago. That's not fair to our players, right? And so sometimes that word should can come from the past. I think that word also crops up when we are dealing with expectations, whether they're in-house, it's also when people are looking in, like we talked about with Carl Pearson a couple of weeks ago, the most dangerous team to coach is a 500 team that brings everybody back because everybody thinks they should be great or they should be better. You know, And as a coach, you're sitting here thinking, 
but we're still small. You know, we're still going to have the same challenges we had last year because we're the same kids that we had last year, right? Like, so there's a reality to that that isn't always perceived or understood on the outside. And that can be difficult. I mean, I think of my last year at, at Linmar when, you know, we struggled to shoot the ball early. And so we were doing a lot of things better, but there was this weight of expectation that we shouldn't be losing these games or why is this game close with a certain team? The reality is, you know, we just weren't shooting the ball well. And so the game's going to be hard until the ball goes in the basket. But that was very difficult for others to accept, which created all sorts of problems and drama and conflict. Again, because we couldn't get past the word should. We should be better. We should have won more games by now. We should be making shots. And that really became a major obstacle for our team that year. Well, I think I mentioned this before on the podcast, but something that I am so afraid of hearing my players say, or that I say during a game is we should be beating these guys. Like once I hear that, like I'm like, we're done, man, because we're living in this world where we have certain expectations and our expectations are are, are dictating our feelings and that's going to affect our performance. So, you know, it comes, coming back to that word should, you know, I also think about, as you're talking about this, uh, the feelings for our players. And I think language is really important. I remember hearing, you know, uh, Jerry Lynch, you know, who's been on the podcast before and, you know, he's been a mentor to people like Phil Jackson and Steve Kerr and all those great coaches. And he always has this line, that he says, which is, you know, there's nowhere else I'd rather be than right here, right now with you. And, and he talks about that line in his books. And, you know, the thing is, you can't just say it to your players like, hey, there's nowhere else I'd rather be there right, right here with you. Like you have to really, truly believe this and feel this. And so it's, yeah, it's using the language, but have we done the inner work as a coach? Have we, do we really, truly, are we present? Are we grateful for the opportunity to coach our players? And if we are, if we are in that moment, we are grateful for whatever opportunity is, whatever challenges, but those challenges, we see them as opportunities. I think that that can actually lead to um, not only just greater performance for us as a coach and for our players, but, but a much more enjoyable experience and journey. And that's what it comes down to is like this idea of journey. And I know that can become very cliche to talk about you know, your journey in sports and it's all about the journey. Um, but this is where it really comes down to. And if, if you talk, if you're, a, if you claim to be a process coach and you have ever said, like, it's all about the journey, uh, then you really shouldn't be <laughs> using that word of should. And, you know, like th that always falling into those comparisons. You're always, instead, you should be locked in that moment. You should be present and, and every challenge that comes your way as a coach, you just see as literally part of the journey. I think you bring up a good point there, JP, where when we get hung up on where we should be or how we should be playing or what the season should be going like, it distracts us from being present, as you described there. And I think the other thing that just continues to come to my mind in terms of why, why does this matter and why is this inhibiting for us as, a, as coaches? I'll give you another example. Let's say that you have a, a parent in your program that makes a lot of noise and complains a lot and where they're calling for meetings and they want to talk to the AD and they're frustrated about the daughter's playing time and they're yapping in the stands or you know whatever it might be. We've all had situations like that at some point in our career. It's one thing for us to just sit back and say, I can't believe she's doing this. This isn't the way parents should be. I don't want the program like, you know, to sort of rant about the circumstance because it's not what it should be. Versus sitting down and trying to figure out, well, this is where we're at. We have this parent in our program. And now what do we do? And I think when I go back and read books like It's Not About the Shark by David Niven, you know, the whole point of that book is to figure out what's the problem, not be distracted by what should be happening, but be focused on what is happening and then invest your energy, not in complaining or despair or comparison, but using your time, using your mental energy to be able to focus on a solution to where you where you are, even if it isn't where you want to be. Well, here's one of the issues I think that we face as coaches, Nate. I think it, the reality is when we sign up for this, and we know this is going to be a hard job. Like coaching is difficult. It, it requires long hours, a lot of conflict. I mean, you're, you're constantly working through conflict with your team uh, on the court, off the court, on the field, off the field. Like it's just a very difficult job. We can go into that all day long, all the challenges that come with it. But once we get into it, 
like we think if we do the things that we set out to do, we, we have some sort of plan for our season or we have some sort of plan for our culture. And we, then we expect there to be no more conflict. Like internally, I think we're like, oh, well, I did all the things I was supposed to do. I held the parent meeting. I had the conversation with the players. I instituted the culture system, right? There's supposed to be no more problems, right? But that's just not the reality of the job. But internally, we have these expectations that everything should be smooth sailing. And uh, we forget that when we sign up for it, this isn't just hard on the front end. It's hard throughout the entire journey. It, it's full of challenges. And I, I, I recently uh, ran an ultra marathon back in June. Um, and it was an 82-mile uh, run that started at 9 p.m. at night. And I ran through the night. <laughs> I had to finish within 21 hours. And I remember being like 50, 55 miles in and just absolutely miserable. Now, not just miserable, but I was miserable that I was miserable. I was complaining internally. I was so like, why am I doing this? And, you know, I I was trying to avoid the discomfort, the pain that was coming. Um, And I had this moment where it switched, which was like, like, what did you sign up for? Like, you knew this going into that this was going to be the hardest physical challenge you've ever done in your entire life. Stop complaining, right? You know, either if I'm going to continue to complain, then I should just quit right now. And so I had this moment where I said, no, I'm not going to quit. I'm going to keep going. And I'm going to stop complaining. I'm going to embrace the challenge. I'm going to embrace the struggles. And that moment, like, was a race-defining moment for me. I say race. I wasn't racing anything, but I didn't just try to get to the end. but. Like it was, you know, powerful. Um, and so I kind of relate that to coaching. Like, it's just like, we know this is going to be tough and you're going to be 50 miles in and you're going to be questioning why you're doing it. So maybe, you know, like, why am I doing this? And, you know, but we have to move beyond all the complaining and the comparisons. When I think about ways that we've tried to address this, just our own mentality as coaches, you know, there's a couple of things that have, that have helped as I've taken this job here at Mount Vernon and we're trying to kind of find our way here couple phrases. Okay. One of them is it's going to be different here. And what I mean by that is, you know, it's easy for me to look at our league and I see down the road, there's a team that has a really good basketball team with a division one point guard and no multi-sport athletes, which means they get to play year round. And then I look over here and I look down the road, the other direction and the team that's won the division a number of years in a row, like they all play club basketball. And neither of those things are reality for where we're at at Mount Vernon. We're not going to have very many kids that are playing AAU just because of the number of multi-sport athletes that we have. And so, you know, on the one hand, I can sit here and complain, how can we compete with that? How can we keep up with those guys? And that doesn't lead me to really any solutions because I'm trying to apply their model to a different situation here at Mount Vernon. And so for us just to be able to say, the puzzle is different here. It's really allowed us to think outside the box and try to refocus us on where we are rather than trying to look outward and say, well, this is where everyone else is. Why doesn't that work for us? There's another phrase that I think when it comes to expectations for our season that has been useful for me. And I don't know if other people have bought into this when I say it or not. Maybe they just roll their eyes. But I look at our situation. Our softball team won the state championship this summer. Our volleyball team is preseason number one and favored to win a state championship here this fall. And then a lot of those players will filter into basketball, you know, for a team that was 12 and 11 last year and only won one game the year before that. So our trajectory is obviously on the rise, right? And so there's going to be different expectations, certainly this year for our team than there were last year when we took over. And I'm already starting to get questions about how good do you think you guys could be? What's the league going to be like this year? Do you think this is the year we break through and get back to state? And, you know, I I honestly, JP, don't spend a lot of time thinking about those questions. I I just sort of say, I don't know, because I haven't seen our team play yet. I haven't seen, you know, the teams in our league and who they have this year and what they're going to look like. And I legitimately don't think I can give you a very accurate estimation of how many games we can win or how many, how good we're going to be. And so that phrase of, I I just don't know. I I mean, I think we're going to be better. I don't know how many games we're going to win, but the place that I land on and my captains have kind of helped embrace this this year is that I'm excited to find out. I'm excited to see how much better we can be. And I think, again, that just grounds me in a place of here's where we're starting from, you know, this group this year, and we're going to just try to keep getting better without necessarily worrying about 
where we should be by the end of the year or what we should accomplish during the season. I'm not really sure. I know the solution is going to be a little bit different here, and that helps me to focus on where we are and just continuing to move forward from there. I think another thing that could help coaches is I think it's great to see ourselves as builders. Like we're trying to build a program, right? And, and, and with that building, we often expect a progression. And, and it's a good way to see our job. But I think it's often, but I think oftentimes it could be helpful to s- sometimes see ourselves maybe a little bit less as builders and maybe, maybe more as gardeners, right? There's going to be some seasons that come through. There's going to be storms. There's going to be dry weather. Like the conditions are not always going to be completely optimal for, for our program. And we have to work through those challenges. That's our job. And it's a lot about is a lot about culture and, and running a great program it is constantly cultivating the good, the good things that are going on there, the good that people are doing. It's identifying those things, it's weeding out the bad things. But I think the the good gardener, I, I think the the good farmer is not going to sit there and get have much time to uh, blame the weather. They're just going to constantly focus on what is that next step, what is it that uh, what is needed in this moment. And I think the same is if you look at and you study, you know, the great card players out there, you know, the great poker players. I've never heard one that blames the cards. By nature, the game is to play the cards that you're dealt the best that you can. And they don't, you know, you don't see, you know, these world-class poker players throwing their cards down and walking out and saying, oh, these are crap. I'm not, I can't do anything with this. It's all the nature of the game is to play the cards we're dealt. And it's the same, I think, in coaching. You know, some days we get seem like everything comes together in our program. You know, the players buy in. We've got strong leaders, you know, that that really, you know, embrace what we're trying to do. And we've got a good parent group that set the stage, you know, for for the for the the culture around the program. And then next year it just seems like you got no leaders, you know, you got a disgruntled parent group that are constantly stirring things up. And and that's just the nature of it. That the the cards are more difficult this year. And oftentimes, coming back to that whole idea of building a program, it can feel like we failed. It can feel like, well, am I doing something wrong? Um, and the reality is, yeah, there's always things that we can improve upon, and maybe you, we make mistakes here and there. But I think there's a bit of just accepting that we're going to go through difficult seasons. We're going to have a few, you know, kind of rough hands that are dealt our way. And what really, and what really matters for us as a coach especially for our example, for our players and the experience that we're trying to create is just that consistency in, in how we show up and that we are grateful, that we are present for the opportunity to be there every day. Well, JP, here's one other place where this word should can get us into a little bit of trouble. And this really is part of the nature of the coaching industry is as you have success, oftentimes that breeds opportunity and As you run into frustration, sometimes that causes you to search for other opportunities. And so, you know, it can be possible for an assistant coach to not get elevated to a head coaching position, either where they're at or somewhere else. And so they're coming back, you know, for another year as a as the head JV coach or as a varsity assistant. And, you know, they're just thinking they can't escape this thought of. I wish I would have had that job or I should have got that job or I shouldn't even be here. And now I'm. You know, I'm just doing this, that, or the other. I'm working with this player, whatever it might be. Like there's a a lingering, nagging sort of regret, whether it was in their control or not, that they are where they are. And sometimes that happens when you are offered a job and you choose to stay. And then things are, you know, topsy turvy that year. And you think, damn, I should have gone, you know, or you take a job and there's that lingering thought of, dang it, I should have stayed. You know, like these things happen, I think, more than we're willing to talk about when we we start moving around in you know in the coaching carousel and i think similar to everything we've shared already that doesn't serve you or your players in the slightest right like every ounce of me sitting here thinking i wish i would have made this decision differently in my career takes away from energy and time that i can devote to where i am it's not fair to my staff it's not fair to my players it's not fair to our program it's not fair to our community and as objectively, we can sit back and think, of course, of course, that decision has been made. There's nothing that can be done now. Why wouldn't you be invested in where you are? But I think part of who we are 
always sort of extrapolates and we imagine what it could have been like somewhere else or what it could have been like if I would have stayed or what it could have been like if I was elevated to a head coach. And sometimes if we're not careful, that can distract us from where we are. I think if you as a coach, if you start to sense that, or if we're talking about this today and any of these points have struck a chord with you, I think there's incredible value in reflection, whether that's you pull out a journal and you know you write down some thoughts here, or like you, Nate, and you get on your lawnmower and you know, go mow, you know, this massive lawn that you've got and just think about stuff and mull things over. But I think we have to reflect on in these moments when we start to use that show of like, all right, where is the opportunity? And, and for me, it would be writing down what are the opportunities to serve individuals in this circumstance? If I'm an assistant coach, what are my opportunities? What are my opportunities to serve at this school this year? I didn't get the opportunity I wanted. Okay, that's fine. How can I serve and how can I grow? And, and what are some ways that I'm actually going to do that better today than I've ever done it before? You know, those would be like three big things. How can I serve today and how can I grow? And what can I do better than I've ever done it before? And, and I think for me, that would be the reflection. Is just it helps us to take that and stop kind of ruminating on those unhelpful thoughts and move towards something that's more beneficial for us and for others. Well, I think you're right on there, JP. The the antidote here really is an, an honest reflection. I think another way to think about that, and this has been helpful for me at times when I've taken other jobs and I've looked at the past or I've looked at jobs that maybe I didn't take, you know, is just to simply on a sheet of paper write a circle. This is where I am. And I'm, I'm just listing. This is the stuff that I'm doing right now. And on the outside of that circle, I'm writing, this is where I'm not. I'm not here anymore. I didn't take this job. I don't have this player. We're not this, that, or the other. And in some ways, that sounds so simple, but I think it does two things. One, it crystallizes, as you said, the opportunities that are inside of that circle that are in front of me. What, what is you know, my challenges? What are the, the, the opportunities to serve, as you described there? But this is the other thing, too, that I think can be healthy is that it does acknowledge like sometimes there is a remorseful feeling when you leave a place and go somewhere else or you make a decision and you think, mm, I wish I would have made a different choice there. That in some respects, like there's a reality there that we also have to accept. Right. And that's OK. But it's just something we have to move through rather than dwell on and, and park at, right? We have to keep moving through that. And sometimes writing it out, whether it's in journal form or you're making circles on a piece of paper or you're sitting on your lawnmower and just being honest with myself, even how I'm feeling with where I'm at is a way forward to get me to become a better coach where I am. All right, that's it for today's episode. Uh, one of the best ways to find contentment on this journey in the process, well, is to have a process. And my book, The Culture System, will give that to you. I guarantee it. So pick up a copy of The Culture System today, and you can get the first chapter free at myculturesystem.com.